Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me this evening to commemorate Rabbi Dr. Moshe David Tendler, Zecher Tzak Levrach. It's actually, it's, it's difficult. I'm so used to saying Shlita at the end, to say Zatzal at the end, it's already a, a painful change. But I first just want to acknowledge all the members of our shul who are here. Thank you for joining, in particular our, our president who is with us as well, Toby Schaefer. And also, again, the uh, rabbis and professors, some of whom have logged on, again, Rabbi Sayani, Dr. Brill, and uh, Ms. Alana Bauman from the school, as well as many uh, numbers and things that I don't recognize. But again, I really appreciate you coming this evening to commemorate Rabbi Tendler's memory. And so this is recorded for other people. Other people will see this recording, but I think the advantage of you being here is I'll give my... I guess you call it a eulogy, a presentation. I'll share my reflections. And then at the end, I'll try to keep some time for Q&A. The first thing I just really want to emphasize is that one has to know their own limits. I by no means am an authority on Rav Tendler. I'm not an authority on what his Psakim were. I mean, I'm familiar, of course, with his Psakim on swordfish, how he thought he had a strict definition of scales. I'm, of course, familiar with his psak on the time of death, on brain death, his whole machlokis, his Rabbi Bleich and Rabbi Herschel Schechter, as well as his position on Tchelis as well. But I don't claim to be an expert. What I do claim simply is that I spent significant time with Rebbe for the last three years of his life. During the last three years of his life, I was Zoha to be in his shir at Yeshiva University. And one year outside of YU here, I still made sure to be Maktish time, to consecrate time to be with Rav Tendler. And during those three years, one of those three years, actually, I, I was actually learning with Rav Tendler Bechavrusa. And so that's a one-to-one -one relationship that we had on a very regular basis for an entire year going into COVID. And so there's certain anecdotes and certain lessons that I think naturally I was only privy to that I want to share with all of you. So I'm just going to first um, pin my video here for the recording. And again, uh, I'll make time for questions at the end. You know, it was very kind was uh, Rachel Fried. She's uh, a granddaughter of Rev Tendler. She reached out to me and she said the nicest thing that in halacha and Jewish law, sometimes it's a little limiting because it only recognizes the relatives but in truth, many of us who were Talmudim, we were students of Rav Tendler, we really, we felt like he was our family. He felt like we were his family. And I'll share some reflections, some experiences of where Rav Tendler, I'm saying this in a positive way, felt less like a Rosh Hashiva to me and more like a grandfatherly figure. And so it's, it's a bit of a, not just intellectual loss, but for me personally, it's, a, it's an emotional, it's a personal loss as well. And so as the Gemara in Menachos and Bava Basra says that Moshe Rabbeinu, according to one opinion, he wrote the final words of the Torah, Bedima, in tears. And while Moshe Rabbeinu, he had the benefit of God dictating the words directly to him. So even when he lacked the composure, he was able still to write the words down. I pray that what I put together this evening, even though, of course, God certainly did not dictate the words to me. I pray that Hashem at least gave me some form of siyat de deshmaya in order for, at least for Rav Tendler's sake, to commemorate him properly. And so even though it's right now, it's still a middle of Shiva, it's shas chimam. It's still a very difficult time. We're still in the thick of things, still trying to gather our thoughts. Like I tell to, as you know, um, the congregants who are on here, as you know, I advise that one cannot do an adequate job eulogizing someone at the funeral. There's no way if someone really feels emotionally connected that they can give a fully adequate eulogy summarizing someone's life. Maybe at Shloshim, maybe 12 months later at the Akamas Matseva, but I think nonetheless there is a value at this moment to share the lessons that I know and to see what we can take away from that. So Marissa, are you able to? All right, thank you. So number one, Rav Tendler, of course, doesn't need me to, I don't need to say this. Rav Tendler was a gadol hador bifnei atzmo. 
on his own merits, in his own right, we know Rav Tenler was a Galodor, one of the leading rabbinic luminaries of our generation. But before I delve into Rev Tenler, and sometimes it's a little unfair, some people limit him, they pigeonhole him only into this. Rev Tenler, of course, was a conduit for understanding his esteemed father-in-law, Rev Moshe Feinstein. And so some of those instances where Rev Tenler elucidated Rev Moshe's position were clear. When you think about the case, for instance, of the Siamese twins, that was one of the most critical and famous medical ethics cases that Ramosha Feinstein ruled on, where he had these two kids that were together. And generally we say, Ain doch in nefesh mipnei nefesh. we don't kill one person to save another person's life, but that's what they had to do. They had to kill essentially one baby to save the other baby's life. Can they do that surgery? And Ramosha Paskin that they could go forward. I was looking for that tshuva of Ramosha. Where did he write about that? And I was so shocked to see there was no tshuva of Ramosha on the topic. Instead, Rev. Tenler shared with me, actually, an article that he published in the Torah Vehorah's Sefer Zikar Lemarana Gora Moshe Feinstein, a publication of Mesifta Teferis Yerushalayim. And in that journal, he published an article where he elucidated Rev. Moshe's rationales. That's something he did publicly for Rev. Moshe. But also what I found in my own experience was that I was privy to insights to Rav Moshe that I don't believe have been published publicly, but I believe he would be okay with me sharing it. One such instance is when we think about what was one of the most revolutionizing tshuvas of Rav Moshe, especially in Kashras. Of course, it's tshuva on the Chal of Stam. The fact that he said if the FDA were to catch people uh, switching cow's milk for non-kosher milk, they would bring the law down upon them. So therefore, in America, we know when we're getting cow's milk, we're truly getting cow's milk. And it was a con- you know, controversial tshuva. He invoked Anun Sahadi, the lump is there. It's fantastic. But at the end of the tshuva and Ramosha's actual personal practice was that Ramosha drank chal of st- uh, did not drink chal of stam. He drank chal of Israel. And so I asked her if Tendler knew. Ramosha Feinstein was willing to be mater chal stam for all of America, what, did he Did he not trust his own sock? Was he okay being mad to everyone else to drink something potentially non-kosher, but he wanted to do it himself? And so Rev. Tendler gave me an insight that is not what I was told, is not what many suggest about Rev. Moshe. Many say, you know, Hinami, Rav Moshe Feinstein was very makbid on, on Chav Yisrael. He wasn't comfortable with his own sock. However, Rev. Tendler told me actually, that based on the Gemara and Subos, there's a story of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, it's a fantastic story, that he's visited by the angel of death. And the angel of death, you know, they, they go on a tour together and he brings him into the Garden of Eden. And Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi actually steals the sword of the angel of death. And until God intervenes, he basically tries to stop the angel of death from killing anyone. Eventually God intervenes, says give the sword back. There needs to be death in this world. But what happened was Rav Shimon Levi was permitted to stay in Gan Eden. He was allowed to enter alive. Why? Because he never annulled a neder. He was never mater in a darm. He never annulled a vow, a commitment that he had. And so Rav Tenler told me that Rav Moshe was a concern from a kosher standpoint. He said that all my life until I came to America, I kept Chal Yisrael. And so if I don't have to change a minhug, since it's such a huge schus, a huge merit not to change one stringent practices, they don't have to, even though, yes, from a kosher standpoint, Chal of Stam is 100% kosher, mahadrin, mahadrin, nonetheless, I'm not going to do it for an external reason due to the concern of changing my practice, of changing my minhug. That's not what the Velt usually says. But that was an insight that I got only because I inquired of Rev. Tentler. And so when I, when Rav Teller and I, a little bit later down the line, when we're learning Bechav Rusa, we're learning one-on-one, and I began my, I told him I was beginning my rabbinic job search, and thank God it worked out well. I'm here with all you guys at Stanford today, Baruch Hashem. So Rav Teller said to me, he said, you know what? We're going to change our limud. We're going to change what we're studying. Instead of learning, I think it was Hilchel Shabbos at the time, we're learning Masechus Shabbos and Hilchel Shabbos. He said, I'm going to compile a list 
of what I consider to be the most, in his words, the most critical chuvas in the Igros Moshe of Rav Moshe Feinstein, that a Rav, that a rabbi needs to know in his career. And so, I mean, sadly, you know, we didn't get to the end of that list because he got sick and we weren't able to continue. But there, the insights he gave on those chuvas were fantastic. And alas, I, I wish I took notes on them at the time. But I remember one shuva I think we started off with was a shuva about how if congregants don't want to shake the rabbi's hand, they want you know, usually some shuls. I'm not sure what we did. I came during COVID. But in many shuls, the practice is, is that after you shake, after you get an aliyah at the Torah, you go up to the stage and you shake the rabbi's hand. But in some shuls, either because they didn't like the rabbi or just, I mean, think about it, in our sanctuary, you know, you have to walk a mile to get up there and climb up that hill to get to the rabbi. So Rav Moshe wrote a whole tshuva how he said that it's a huge affront. You have to go up to shake the rabbi's hand, and that's kavo tamidei chachamim. And actually, there might be dini mumnus, there might be monetary ramifications. And Rev Tendler thought that that was an important tshuva for me to internalize. So um, it's okay, though. I'm mochel. Certainly during COVID, don't come up and shake my hand. Otherwise, I'll have to purell it for the million times. So I'm definitely mochel on that. So... Nonetheless, even though Rev Tendler was, as I said, a, a conduit, I, again, I don't want to emphasize this too much because I want to get to Rev Tendler himself. You know, Rev Tendler was a conduit for Rev, understanding Rev Moshe better in ways that no one else explained. There were occasions that Rev Tendler actually he disagreed with Rav Moshe. One such instance, and again, the folks here at Agud Hashem will appreciate this one, and we did this in a shir together. There is an instance in a tshuva where a Moshe came down really hard on shuls that open up their parking lots on shops. Uh, yes, I can see you guys all uh, putting your hands over your head. That's that's what we have here in our community. So a Moshe Feinstein, if you remember from our shear, I think it's about a year ago at this point when I was uh, brave enough or stupid enough to teach it at the shul. A Moshe Feinstein said, not only is a shul that opens its parking lot to welcome people to drive in on Shabbos violate lifne ever losite michshol, which generally, when I help someone, I facilitate someone else doing a sin, I am punished due to lifne ever losite michshol. Don't place a stumbling block in front of a blind person. It doesn't just mean literally a stumbling block, but it means putting a sin in front of somebody also is a spiritual stumbling block. That's what most posts can say. Rav Moshe took it to the next step. And he said, not only is it lifting Eber, but you are the category of a Masis. What's a Masis? A Masis is a special category, someone who basically entices others and tries to seduce them to worship by Vodazar, to worship idolatry. And that person, you don't have any mercy upon him. You come down hard with the full force of Bastin and the Adam come to him first. Terrible. It's like the worst thing it could possibly be. And that's what Ramosha categorized it as. People who leave their parking lots open and invite people to drive in on Shabbos. So Rav Tendler said to me, he said, look, I obviously am not encouraging people to drive. It's Havara. You're making a fire in Shabbos when you drive. But nonetheless, I thought Rav Moshe maybe took it a little too harshly with the category of Masis. So Rav Tendler was willing to unequivocally disagree with Ramosha when he thought on the rare occasion Ramosha was incorrect. But of course, he did so with reverence and with great respect for his father-in-law. So if you permit me just one more thing about Ramosha, actually not about Ramosha, but actually about Ramosha's daughter, which of course was Rev Tendler's wife. After I developed enough rapport with Rebbe, I, I finally, like, I was curious, and I want to learn more about Rebbe as a person, not just as a Rosh Yeshiva. And so I asked Rebbe, I want to inquire how he met his wife. You know, how do you meet the daughter of Rav Moshe, Sh uh, Shifra Feinstein? So I, you know, was still developing rapport with Rebbe at the time. I wasn't fully comfortable asking it point blank. So instead, what I asked was, I asked, how did Rebbe become connected with Rav Moshe? Rav Tendler picked it up right away. He's like, ah, so how did, how did I meet my wife? Okay, let me tell you the story. And the way, and the way it goes, the way Rav Tendler told it to me, and maybe there's different versions of how he said it in his life, I'll tell you the way he told it to me, was that 
back in the day, there was apparently this library on the Lower East Side where all the Jewish kids would go to hang out. You know, kind of like at YU today, there's the library, that's where people go, they attempt to find a mate, it doesn't really work out so well because everyone's awkward at YU with co-ed, uh, co-ed interactions, but that's for another time. But there was this library where all the Jewish kids, the boys and girls would go to hang out. Ruff Taylor was there, shuckling back and forth. I believe he studied at NYU, so he's studying biology at the time as a college student. And then a, a girl approaches his desk, his table where he's studying, and has a uh, Shaila for him in biology, a Shaila for him in science. Who was this girl? It was none other than Shifra Feinstein, the daughter of Rav Moshe Feinstein. So fast forward some time later, Rav Moshe approaches Rav Tendler's father. Now, Rav Tendler's father, Rav Moshe, actually, they were colleagues. In fact, I believe Rav Tendler told me that uh, in certain instances, they sat on the same basin. So they were very close. They ruled on the same rabbinical courts. Ramosha goes over to Rav Tendler and says, look, uh, you have a good son. I have a good daughter. Let's read a shidduch. Let's make them get, let's, you know, let's suggest that they get married. Let's see if they're, if they're good for each other, if they're compatible. Rav Tendler thinks that's a marvelous, Rav Tendler's father thinks it's a marvelous idea. So he approaches his son. He approaches Rav Tendler and says, you know, this is what Ramosha suggested to me. New, would you be amenable to going out on a date with his daughter, with Shifra? And so Ratana responded and said, I think that's a great idea and I appreciate you suggesting it. But don't worry, I already got this taken care of. I'm already pursuing that lead. Thank you very much. And so <laughs> when you hear about all these stories about, you know, usually we hear about this Rebbe and this Gadol, they make a Shidduch, and then the, the two kids, they meet in a hotel lobby, and after a few dates, they get married. So, you know, sometimes people meet through a Shidduch, sometimes people don't. Sometimes it's Eliezer bringing back the Shidduch for Yitzchak, and other times it's uh, Yaakov going to meet Rachel. And this was like an instance of Yaakov going to meet Rachel, where Rev Tendler and his, and his future wife, Shifra, they, they met actually on their own, which, as you, I know you've all watched for Learn on the Roof, that's, of course, scandalous in the traditional community. And so on a more poignant note, when I was at the Levi, I went to Muncie and, oh, my gosh, everyone was packed into the interrupt Tendler shul in Muncie. Uh, Baruch Hashem, masks were strictly enforced. Everyone's wearing masks, but people were like flowing out the doors. And I, it took me like I was constantly inching myself forward until one guy left his seat. And then I said, you're not coming back. I jumped in his seat and I finally got a seat like an hour and a half in. And perhaps one of the most poignant things that I heard at the funeral was that Rev Tenler, as we heard, he passed away on Shemini Atzeres over Yontif. But what I didn't realize was that Shmi Atzeres was also the birthday of his wife, Shifra. And so the way the, the children and the grandchildren described it is uh, we're, we're told by Chazal that a tzaddik, like Moshe Rabbeinu, they die on the same day that they were born. And so Rev Tenler, so to speak, his half of his neshama he wasn't fully complete until he was married. Half his neshama, his wife, was born on Shemini Atzeres. And so it was only apropos that HaKadosh Baruch Hu kept Rebbe alive long enough that he was, he was able to return to be complete with the other half of his soul to go back to his, his wife who was waiting in heaven for him. And so the way the children put it, it was, it was like a a birthday present for their mother that Rav Tendler finally got to be reunited with his wife on the day that she was born. So I thought that was a, um, it was a particularly poignant note. And uh, with, with that, we'll, we'll conclude talking about Ramosha for now. And I want to talk more about my own experiences with Rav Tendler personally. Rav Tendler was known to be a firebrand, right? Let's just say it as it is. He, he was known to be a zealot. He spoke his mind. I think there was a, um, a Jewish Telegraphic Agency article. It went, the title went something like, um, Rav, Rabbi Moshe Tendler thinks you're wrong and he's not afraid to tell you. It's something like that. And while it's funny because in the last three years of life, I think he mellowed a little bit because, you know, I had Rav Tendler here, like this grandfatherly figure. Now, he certainly had his opinions. 
he certainly still believed what he believed 30 years ago. Nothing changed. I remember actually sitting with him before COVID in his office, and he was telling me how he was working with a group of rabbis to petition the Israeli government that they should maintain orthodox standards for what, who's considered a Jew, for what's considered marriage, as we know that didn't exactly succeed as of late. But he was, he was still, you know, uh, it's Christian Bible statement, but fighting the good fight, so to speak. He was still fighting for orthodoxy, fighting for what he saw to be MS, even at the final stages in the final chapter of his life. Nonetheless, even though Rav Tendler had his convictions and he spoke very strongly when he was convinced that he was right, I got to see a side of him that also displayed his humility, his intellectual honesty, that there are times that he could be wrong as well. He's only a human being, a very great, wise human being, but a human being fallible like anyone else. Actually, I'm not, I'm not going to test you guys right now, but if you remember the sheer that I gave for the shul for a good in my interview, anyone remember? <laughs> I see Toby remembers. <laughs> Which essentially, it's in the Gemara Nida and Avodah Zara. In, in layman's terms, it means don't go shopping for a heter. Don't go shopping for a rabbi. If one rabbi gave you a psak, don't go to a second rabbi to get that psak overturned. And so I was preparing the shear for the shul for my interview. And I asked Rebbe at the time, I said, you know, what's what are you paskin on this? Because there's a hakira on the sugya. There's a hakira, dichotomy, how to understand why you're not supposed to go to a second rabbi. Is it because you are just halakhically bound by the first psak that was given to you? Or you're not bound by it per se, but for you and for the second rabbi to give a psak contrary to the first rabbi is an affront to his dignity. It's an affront to the kavod of the first rabbi. When I asked Rav Teller what he paskin, he said, he said to me, and I guess I deduced what he held in the sugya, he said that if someone comes to him and asks him a shayla, and they don't really feel comfortable with what Rav Tenler says. He says, by the way, you, I permit you. You're welcome to get a second opinion. You're welcome to go to another rabbi if you don't feel comfortable with what I told you. And in fact, I remember, thank God it wasn't halakha lamaisa, it wasn't practical, but I wanted to know if, you know, I'd say God forbid, but I mean, it's only inevitable that I will deal with these shilohs of abortion that come up. Or Moshe Feinstein, again, one of his most scathing chuvos was on abortion, where he basically determined that abortion was murder. That's what he, he took the most extreme position on it. Unlike the Tzitzeliezer, unlike Sri Aish, unlike many others, but that's where Moshe held, which gives you very little leeway to be lenient if the mother's life is not in danger. So I asked her to tell her, like, Rebbe, you know, if I go to you from Sock on these matters, uh, but I'm looking for some flexibility, is that possible? So Rebbe said to me, look, you know, these are my convictions. I hold like Rav Moshe on it. I think he's 100% correct, but you should know, look, if you're looking for flexibility, I, I won't be offended. I, I welcome you to seek recourse elsewhere if, uh, if, that's, if that's what you think is right, if that's what you think you need. So even though he held strong to his convictions, he never backed down. He was unequivocal. He also acknowledged, he had the intellectual honesty and humility to acknowledge that there are those who think differently. And you know what? They may even be right on occasion. But what I learned from Rev. Tendler also wasn't just about halacha, about Jewish law. In fact, even though we were studying our primary svarna, we say were the Gemara, the Talmud, the Shulchanar, the Code of Jewish Law, or Egle Tal, Rev. Tendler, every Thursday, he would designate, be makish some time for us. He'd always pull out the end of the shear, his like, huge, rusty old medrash rabbo off the shelf. And as many of us are likely familiar, while the Talmud is the main corpus of Jewish law of halacha, Medrash Rabbah is the main corpus of Jewish ethics. Now, of course, halacha is ethical, but like the more the stories, the narratives, the homiletical teachings of the rabbis. Rabbi Tendler said, he, he lamented actually, that many great scholars, many people who are otherwise great Talmud Chachamim, have neglected Medrash Rabbah. They, they haven't studied it. And so he would always make time for us to study Medrash Rabbah, not just to study Jewish law, but to understand the broader ethical underpinnings of our faith. And, and Rav Tendler truly lived what we learned. He was truly 
an, a very ethical, very moral, a very righteous person. Or tell her, Rebbe wouldn't want to waste time. He wanted to maximize our time during Shear when we learned together. But nonetheless, he had his phone with him because he's answering life and death Shilas, and he expects urgent calls all the time. One, one story that remains with me was one of the one of the staff members at REITs at the rabbinical school at YU. He had just recently had a grandchild that was born in Israel, but was in critical condition, put in the NICU right away in Hadassah Hospital. And Rev Tendler, when he was called and he was told about that, he immediately got on his phone. He called his granddaughter, I believe his granddaughter, who was a doctor at Hadassah Hospital and asked her as soon as she could to go to the family there and offer whatever she could in order to comfort them. And this gave a great measure of solace to the family in America who thought there was nothing they can do. Rev Tendler interceded and he sought a way in order to help those that he could. And it didn't have to be just poskening medical ethics Shilos, but also really practically doing things to help people who were in dire straits. But on a more, on a more, I guess we'd say a, a more humorous and more light note, going back to my relation with Rev Tendler and our the nature of our one-to-one learning that we had. So at the time I was a Shoal Meshiv. I I worked in educational capacity with one of the classes, one of the Shirim for the undergraduate students at YU during their base medrash time to help them. And the issue was there were some days that I had that responsibility back to back with Rev Tendler, with my time with Rev Tendler. So what we would have to do is, well, I, what I would have to do is I would have to eat lunch at some point. And Rev Tendler, thank God, was very understanding. He let me bring my lunch to Shear. So every day I would come with my same Tupperware with honey bunches of oats in it. I come with my thermos with cold milk from a home. And uh, while we're learning, you know, I take the thermos out, I pour the milk in. And as we're learning, I'd be like shoveling in the honey bunches of oats as we, uh, as we went along. And he was, he was totally okay with that. One day, I have my thermos. I must have screwed it on really tight. And I'm just, you know, whenever you try to get like a pickle jar open and it's impossible, it was one of those moments. I kept trying and trying and trying and it wouldn't budge. Rev Tendler, who was 93, 94 years old at the time, he reaches over to the thermos. He grabs it, he doesn't he grabs it and he picks it up and he starts working on it himself to try to get it open. And while he didn't successfully get it open, he did budget just enough that I was able to do the mock of a potash and get it off, all because of his efforts. And it was it was moments like that that Rev Tendler certainly felt, and I say this in the most loving and positive way, felt much less like a Rosh Shiva to me and very much much more like a, a grandfatherly figure. Um, you know, the small, the small, subtle interactions like that. And so one day, again, taking place in his office, we come in and there's boxes of sfarim everywhere, boxes of books on the floor everywhere. What happened? The university, they moved him from first hole, from one building to Gluck, which is nice. It's a nicer accommodations there. What they, I'll be charitable, what they forgot to do was to stock the books on the shelf. You're not going to let this 90-something-year-old elderly gentleman start picking up all these heavy sfarim putting on the shelf. So, of course... I offer my rabbi, I said, look, I'll find time. When I have a break, I'll come up. I'll help rabbi. You'll tell me where to put the storm. I'll put them on the shelf for you. And our tendler put his foot down. He said, no. Listen to his integrity. He said, no. If you're going to help a member of the staff of the university, you need to be compensated for your time. Like, rabbi, you're my rabbi. I'm doing you. I'm, I'm supposed to help you. Let me help you. He said, no. This is the university's responsibility. They'll find a way to do it. If they get you to do, if they compensate you, that's okay. But you know, you you have a wife, you have uh, bills you need to pay. Your time is precious. I'm not going to let you do it. And uh, I went back to the office. I said I, I would offer to help, but he wants either he wants you to send some of the staff members to do it instead. He doesn't want to take advantage of me or even come close to taking advantage. And I really appreciate it because it's always 
it's uncomfortable for me in my rabbinic role. Sometimes I ask volunteers, you know, can you help with the lulav distribution? Can you help us organize the shul roll Torah? And sometimes like, you know, I know people volunteer, they want to do a mitzvah, but it's like a tinge of guilt in me. Like, I feel like I'm taking advantage of people almost. And Rev Tendler wanted to stay very far away from that. And so I really admired that subtle integrity that he showed in uh, just these small moments. No one, no one else was watching. I was the only one who knew about it. And, um, and I, I was very impressed by that. But then came COVID-19. Then came the period of Zoom. The issue was, is that, was that Rav Tendler was ensconced in his home in Muncie, and he was essentially by himself for a while. There was, I think, a good month at the beginning after why you closed down that we, we, we spoke on the phone, but we really couldn't get sheer back on the road. I mean, I was still adjusting, figuring things out my family. Either. We know it was a huge upheaval then. And it took like a month, a month and a half till he finally got on Zoom. What was the issue? According to what he told me, uh, I don't know if it was Reeds or YU or somebody said they were going to eventually have somebody come over or someone instruct Rabbi Tendler how to get Zoom on his computer. Right? It's 90 something year old man. I mean, many of us here are, are younger than 90, and we also struggled with getting Zoom on our computers. So alachas kama v'kama, certainly for him. What happened? Rav Tendler gets on the phone with me and he's <laughs> expressing his frustrations. He says, instead of sending some young guy like you over who knows, who has basic fluency in technology, what do they do? I'm not going to say his name. Some, they had some Rosh Yeshiva in his like 60s and 70s come over to help Rav Tendler install Zoom on his computer. You know, like, oh, you know, like, Teller's nice. And maybe someone's like, you know, 15, 20 years younger. He's a strapping young lad who knows how to use Zoom. This Rosh Hashim didn't know what he was doing either. He couldn't get Zoom on Rev Teller's computer either. And so we had to go like another few weeks until somebody, a family member, I, face, I don't know who it was, got over there and finally got Zoom on his computer for us to continue learning together. But, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know what the... But the thought process, I mean, it's very kind of that Rosh Yeshiva to, to drive over there. I, I certainly don't want to minimize that, but it was a, uh, it was a very humorous, uh, it was very humorous, if not frustrating when uh, Rev. Tendler had to go through that. But before, before he got on Zoom, so we, we'd have phone conversations. We tried to do sheer, we tried to learn on, on, on the phone. It wasn't so easy. And what I was impressed was that Rev. Tendler, it showed a certain degree, again, of humility and willingness to learn MS, to learn the truth from wherever it comes from. That Rebbe would, you know, he would bounce ideas off me. He would call me up to almost, it was weird, like consult my opinion on a halachic matter. Like here you have on a gedole olam, a gedole hador. Why is he like asking this pipsqueak talmud of his what he thinks about a halachic matter? But nonetheless, one of the issues that came up, the first Pesach of COVID, especially back when we thought that COVID uh, transfer with touching, or even if you were like 50 feet apart outside. So the issue is generally before Pesach, you want to sell your chametz. What do you do? You, f- you fill out a shtar harsha. You fill out a power of, ter- of attorney document and you give it to the rabbi. And then what do you do? The rabbi gives you the pen, you lift it up, and it's not actually a Kenyan. A lot of people think when they do that, they're giving me the chametz so that I can then sell it to Chris. That's not actually how it works. You are simply appointing me. Your chametz is still yours. You appoint me to sell it on your behalf, power of attorney. So you, everyone does this. Everyone does this. You lift a pen, you lift a handkerchief, and that concretizes your intentions to appoint me. So I tell her, I said, what am I supposed to do this year during COVID? So what he did was, what he devised, was that they would take the Shtar Harsha, they take the document, and they put it in his mailbox, in his Rishus, in his domain. And that way, that would work well enough as a concretizing action to solidify their appointment of him to sell the chametz on their behalf. But he wasn't sure. You know, he was, he was going back and forth, and he asked me my opinion on it. I said, Rabbi, I think that's a wonderful idea. I love the svar behind it. And I believe that's what he actually did in the end. People printed the documents, and then they put it in his mailbox. And it was, uh, but again, I was really taken by the humility that Rav Tendler would just call up a Talmud and say, what do you think? What do you, what do you have to say about this? So again, like on the one hand, we know Rav Tendler in the public sphere as this bombastic force who would propound what he believed to be MS, what his convictions, but nonetheless, he was willing to, again, find truth wherever it might come from. I want to share, let me see if I could share on the screen. I want to share some, uh, 
some photos over here. Let's see if uh, I just get a, a thumbs up if you uh, you see the see the photo, the slides. Okay, good. Thank you. So, you know, just a few photos I wanted to share. Number one, this is actually uh, I don't know if you could tell I look a little maybe slightly younger in here. I guess for those of you who are like 70s and 80s, like you look the same. But this was the, after our first year of learning together when I took your day with Rev Tendler. And you, know, you, put it, you see in, a chavru, in, in, in quotation, but my chavrusa, we, we learned one on one. It wasn't chavrusa, he was the Rebbe still. You know, definitely was at a level playing field. But I actually, before this photo was taken, I was leaning down, scrunching over a Rebbe's chair to get a photo. He said, no, 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 I'm standing up for you. All right. I'm not going to make you bend down, I'm going to stand up to take this photo with you. And mind you, I mean, Rebbe had a walker at the time. It wasn't a simple matter. Every time he got up, it was a whole avoda. But nonetheless, um, you could see him standing straight up over there to take a photo. Rather than make the Talmud bend down, he got up to meet the Talmud. So here, actually, my, my friend and colleague, and you guys know who he is in Stanford, Rabbi, now, now Rabbi, I believe, Rabbi Noah Marlow, he was walking through the base medrash at YU at the time, and I'm very thankful to him. He actually, he snapped this photo over here, a candid photo of us learning what I think may have been a Mishnah Brua before Pesach time here in the base Medrash. And I would actually notice later on, if you look over here, that's either a set of Dibros or Igros Moshe right above Rav Tendler's head. So very appropriate of Moshe Sfarim are actually situated right above Rav Tendler's head here in the photo. It's something I only, I only noticed later on. Uh, so here, here's just a, a, a random photo of me. I, I came into the room. This is the office that Rav Tendler and I learned in. And he didn't notice that I walked in. I walked in very subtly. And I actually snapped a quick photo of Rebbe just, you know, marking up his safer, preparing for sheer. And I'll have to frame it at some point and get it onto, get it onto my wall along with everything else. And uh, here's a, a side photo. Rav Tendler, of course, was a big proponent of Techeles. He claimed they, we, we found the, was the Merculus, Trunculus, whatever you call it, in the, in, the, uh, in the Latin. We found the source for the blue dye. And so here he is um, showing, demonstrating what Techeles looks like and elaborating upon the, the Dina. This over here is something I found actually just last night, I believe. This is great. Can you see what he has over here, what Tendler has here in the photo? What he has, now you might think it's either a gefilte fish or it's a pastry, a bread. It's actually a cow's udder. In Yoridea, we learned about kichal. And there's a whole kashrus conundrum with udders because it's meat with milk inside. And Chazal were afraid that if you eat the udder with milk, even though it's mutter really, people think that you can eat basar v'chal if you eat meat and milk together. And so Rav Teller wanted to show us the anatomy of an udder. And so he actually brought an udder here into a classroom. Why? I, I doubt he got clearance on this, by the way. One of our doctor friends looked at this photo and she's like, oh, my God, he wasn't even wearing gloves when he did this. But you can see on YouTube, I won't play it now, that he took a he, would, he cut it open to show us the milk inside. <laughs> You'll see in the video, he is saying, like, where'd all the milk go? Apparently, the, the udder that he bought, I don't know where you buy an udder from, I guess the butcher, wherever you go, um, they must have drained the milk out of it. So he's very disappointed. But again, how many Rebbeim, how many Rebbeim bring, uh, bring an udder to class? I think there's a, a Talmud of Rabbi Shimshon uh, Nadel, I believe is his name, who was a Sooner of Tendler. He commented on the post that I shared of this. He said that he remembers when he was taking Nida with Rev Tendler, Rev Tendler brought in index cards with Badika cloths on there, with, blo uh, with blood from menstruation on there. And he passed it around the room and said, "No, is this a Kesem, right? Does it make her a Nita? Does it, is, this, is, this, is this problematic? Is it more than a Gris? What's the, well, not a Gris, it wouldn't matter actually, it's a Badika cloth. Um, but nonetheless, you know, can you, can you look at the Maros on here and determine what we're looking at or is this blood that we're seeing? So that's, that's very, uh, that was very, that was Rav Tendler. He, and this was emphasized at the funeral. He always said, you have to understand the mitzvahs. Before you can get into the halachic analysis, you need to know the data before you can apply the halacha. If you have the wrong facts, you're going to misapply the halacha. The classic sugya of killing lice on Shabbos. Ah, 
So this story I want to share, I'll come back to the photo in just a moment. I'll show it to you. So this was a very special moment. Rav Tenner and I, of course, we, you know, I, I had unfettered access to Rav Tenner. We learned one-on-one in his office. Eventually, as you saw in the pre, in one of the previous photos, eventually we went down to the base of to learn together. And I figured, look, if we're learning in his office, I have one-to-one access to Rebbe. Uh, at the time, Marissa had finished graduate school in speech language pathology, and she was about to start her, her job in about a week from that time. So we figured, I'm going to learn in yeshiva that day. I'm going to learn with Rev Tendler. Why doesn't she come up and join our Chavrusa? I guess it's a uh, Chabura, a tri Chavrusa, whatever you want to call it. And Rev Tendler was so excited. In fact, I, I spoke to Rabbi Chaim Bronstein who was the previous, for the longest time, the administrator of REITs. And Rabbi Brown, he said, whatever Rev Tendler saw him, he would always express how excited he was and how much he loved this experience, that Marissa, my wife, joined us for our Chavrusa. And let, let me, you know, actually, let me bring it back on the screen over here. So it was such a special experience learning with both my Rebbe, both my wife, we were all together. And so I asked, I said to Rebbe, I really want to just, remember this beautiful treasured moment that we had together and it's really honestly for him and for me also i, I think this is one of the most treasured moments i i had with rebbe and one of the most treasured moments i had in my life in general is uh, so i wanted to remember it so right before i took the photo i took a selfie rebbe quickly marissa's about we were about we're done learning for today marissa's about to close her gemara and her says no Keep your Gemara open. She says, why? We're done learning. He says, because people are going to see this photo and they should see that women can learn Gemara as well. And so you look at the photo over here. You see, I have my Gemara open and Marissa kept her Gemara open over here so that all of you and anyone else who comes into my home uh, and sees the photo up there, they'll see that women learn Gemara as well. And so Rev. Tendler really valued the advanced Talmud study for women. In fact, he was very proud, uh, I think, of Rachel, if not other granddaughters, that he had that studied in YU's GPATS program, where they, uh, where they study Gemara, where women study in a graduate program to learn Talmud, to learn Gemara, and to understand how Kaddish Baruch Hu's Torah better. That being said, brace yourself, a uh, trigger warning, if I may. That doesn't mean Rav Tendler was this, was this progressive, very far from it. Rav Tendler was as traditional as any Orthodox rabbi was on social issues, uh, whether it be about women in Judaism, whether it be about LGBT issues. I'll, uh, I won't elaborate on that over here. Uh, this is getting recorded. I'll get, it, I'll get in trouble. But, you know, you see, Rav Tendler can say things not get in trouble. I, I, I have a career still, so I have to be careful. I could get in trouble. So I won't elaborate on that. But, you know, for instance, like, he would just, not to provoke even, like, this is just how he understood the way the world works. He would ask questions like, oh, so what's your wife making for Shabbos? And when we're learning your day, we're learning Kashra, so learning Bishel and Shabbos, he'd say, oh, you see, like, does your wife do that when she makes you food? Does she use a cliche or a cliche for that? Or, you know, when your wife cooks this, does she do not bar not this way? So it was always the assumption was ask your wife when you get home how she cooks in the kitchen. Marissa didn't enjoy that, by the way. She didn't like that assumption. She, I, I mean, I think she forgave him nonetheless, but I mean, between you and me, uh, okay, she's, she's, she's not here right now. Uh, I could say this. I mean, Marissa does actually do all the, but 90, 96% of all the cooking at home. I, I make omelets from time to time in the morning, but that, that's, that's the limit of my capacity. She claims I could do more, but um, I claim I'm incapable, you know. Um, uh, I'm a, I, I don't know that much. So, Rev T- so Rev Tendler would always, ch- she, he actually chided her one time uh, because he asked, he asked Marissa when we we're on Zoom together during COVID, we we're stuck in our apartment. Marissa was there and he asked her some new, what are you making for Pesach? She said, oh, you know, I'll probably make some chicken and we'll, we'll eat like a nice flashing meal. Does chicken? That's it? You only make chicken on Pesach? Pesach deserves meat, deserves basar. And so Marissa's like, okay, okay, maybe, maybe we'll have some meat on Pesach. But you know, that that was like the uh that was like the re- relationship that we had. And, and you know, don't don't think that that means he he did he used this as a his traditional standards, traditional understanding to disrespect women, God forbid. I remember one time, again, I was on Zoom, 
Marissa had walked into the apartment after running an errand. And I quickly, you know, muttered. I said, oh, hi, welcome back. You know, I'm a little cheer with Rev Tendler. Rebby didn't hear what I said. He said, is everything okay? I saw you had to look to the side. You got distracted. I said, oh, you know, Marissa just walked in the door. My wife just walked in. He said, and so what did you do? Because she walked in. I said, oh, I said, hello. He said, that's it? All you do is say hello and your wife comes in. When your wife walks in the door, you're supposed to stand up for her and show her honor and give her your attention. And I said, oh, uh, okay. Um, hi, Marissa. I stand up for her. And she's like, okay, Marcia, don't stand up. That's really weird. Don't do that. So while I, I can't say I adopted the practice that Tender told me to do, I certainly try to take the, the moral into account. And uh, certainly uh, respecting one's wife is a, uh, hopefully, unequivocally, a uh, very good value. Right, Marissa? Yeah. Okay. Uh, she agrees. Uh, so, I mean, nonetheless, again, you know, you had Ruth Tendler. Ruth Tendler had his shitos. Nonetheless, he believed that just because there's gender roles, and trust me, he held like Rav Moshe on gender roles. You see Rav Moshe Shuv on, on women wearing talis, and he explicates that very clearly. Nonetheless, he believed that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us a beautiful Torah, and why should we deprive half of our population of understanding the beauty, the sophistication that Kaddish Baruch Hu has to offer us. And Baruch Hashem, I could say at our own shul, nobody, nobody even gives a second glance when we have many women sitting around the table along with the men studying Gemara with us in our weekly uh, our weekly Gemara class that we have. And I know I can see a number of you who are here with us now are part of are a part of that shear. So it's a, it's a very special thing we have, and he would he would have loved to see that. I'll share one more thing just about the just about Rav Tendler's last few months when he was alive. The last few months for Rav Tendler were exceedingly difficult. Uh, he broke his hip at some point and got a surgery, and from there it was really downhill. And he would be discharged from the hospital one day, but then back in for something else, an infection, another surgery. And he had all these surgeries, but it didn't stop him from teaching Torah. He lived to teach Torah. All he wanted was to teach. As I shared on Shabbos in the sermon, those who were out there in the tent or those who were there between Chamar, you heard that, as Rabbi Akiva says in the Gemar Meseches Psachim, Yosemi Masha Egel wrote to Linok, Hapara wrote to Lahanik. More so than the baby calf desires to drink the milk of its mother cow, its mother has an even greater desire to give and to nurture and to provide the milk for its little calf. And this is really what Rev Tendler was. As much as I love to learn from Tendler, and I really did, he lived to give to his Talmidim. He lived to transmit the MS and the Mesora of our, of our religion, of Yiddishkeit. And so even like right after having a surgery, he was immediately back at it. Let's see if we can get the slide up there. Right here, you can see, I took a screenshot of it because I was, I was just so thoroughly impressed by this. You can see he's, he's right here. It's, it's a hospital room. You can see him in the chair. I think he's might even be hooked up to an IV still. But the moment he was able to sit up, he was able to talk. He immediately had his family. So he told him, I'm giving sheer right now. You know, call up the boys, I'm giving sheer. And, you know, they, uh, I, I show them free and related this in the funeral. They said, okay, well, Rebbe, maybe, uh, I mean, um, uh, daddy, you know, let's, let's get, Abba, let's get a, a white shirt on you so you can look respectable, look like a And so they, they, you can see they put him in a white shirt actually right here so he could give sheer. And he was, he went right back to it. He went right back to giving sheer from his hospital room. He, really persisted. And what I'm told from the family was the ability to still teach. And you see Asher Shanabrug, a Talmud that logged on as well. You can see that his desire to give shir and to teach Torah really is what kept him going as long as, as he did. And, and so the, as time progressed and we came to the last few months of Rebbe's life, there was actually a huge lapse of time that I didn't hear from Rebbe because due to whatever his illness was, his, his speech, his ability to talk deteriorated 
And it was very difficult for him to talk. I remember one time he was giving, he was teaching, he was giving shear. I was on and he was there with one of his, maybe, I don't know if it was his son-in-law or a nephew and a middle shear, like he just couldn't formulate or articulate the words anymore. And, you know, his relative actually jumped in there to finish the shear, but it was, it was so difficult watching in the middle of shear. He kind of just ran out of the energy to speak. He couldn't formulate anymore. Uh, but he, he kept in the middle of shear, he's like, he pushed his way back. And he's like, no, let me continue giving shear. But there was at a certain point, he was just in the hospital for a very long time, for a long period until, until he passed away. One night, there are only three weddings I've been to since COVID began, as far as I recall. My brother, my brother-in-law, and uh, my close friend, Yair Lichtman, got married recently, uh, a few months ago. I was at the wedding, you know, first wedding in a while. The other ones were at the beginning of COVID, but first wedding in a while. Thank God everything's safe. All of a sudden, I get a buzz on my phone. I pick my phone up. I look at the caller ID, and I say, oh, my God, it's Rev Tendler. Like, I remember screaming out at the table, and everyone's, like, looking at you know, like, What's okay? Big deal. Like, you know, got a call from a rabbi. You know, like there's a lot of rabbis here at this wedding. Uh, everyone from Reno was there at YU. But still, I was like so excited. I, I run out of the wedding hall. I answer the phone. I say, Oh, Rabbi, it's so good to hear from you. It's been so long. And it was very bittersweet because, on the one hand, I, I heard Rebbe's voice. But on the other hand, it was exceedingly difficult to hear the words that he was speaking. It was. He had such a hard time formulating himself. It was most, mostly in, almost, almost incoherent. But there was one thing that he repeated over and over again. And it's the one sentence that I was able to make out. The one sentence he kept repeating was, he said, the Seder Halimud. What's going to be with our Seder Halimud? Maisha, what's going to be with our Seder Halim? What are we learning next year? When are we going to continue learning? What's the next Sefer that you want to learn? What's the next area of Halacha? What are you interested in right now? And he kept saying, the Seder Halimud, what's going to be with our Seder Halimud? And he repeated that again and again and again until finally one of the relatives, I think in the background I heard, came. And said, okay, I, I think, Rebbe, I, th I think you need to rest now. And we got off the phone finally. And as far as I can remember, those were the last words I remember hearing from him. Our Seder Halimud. What is going to be with our Seder Halimud? And sadly, our, our Seder Halimud, I like to believe, has come to an end, but a temporary end. Until which point I, I pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that one day in Olam Haba we'll be reunited and we'll be able to continue the Seder Halimud that we had together here in life. And it's a, it's a difficult time right now. On the one hand, some people might say, you know, he lit, Rav Tendler lived to 95 years old, Kinayahara. He lived a long life both in Arichas Yamim in quantity, but also in quality, a very fulfilling life, a very productive life beyond what most people could accomplish. And to a certain degree, one might say we shouldn't be mourning Rev Tendler, but we should be celebrating his life. That's what we say sometimes at a funeral. We're celebrating the life of Plony Almoni. It's a, I'm a little selfish. It's a little difficult for me because I, I was only granted three years with Rev Tendler. And so it's difficult to, to part after such little time, but I really thank Akadosh Baruch Hu for giving me that special time with Rev Tendler. And I really am just left with the indelible impression of a man, a rabbi, Rosh Hashiva, an individual who lived that statement of Rabbi Akiva, Yosri Masha Egel Rotsa Linok Apar Rotsa Lahanik. More than I benefited, more than I could desire to learn, more than any Talmud could desire to learn from Tendler, and he had so much to offer us. He offered us. He gave us so much. His desire to give, his desire to transmit the Masora to us, that was greater than anything else. And that's what kept him going until the ripe old age of 95. Tainish Moses Rebetzura Chaim. 
I, I, I wish Nechama to the family, to everyone here who knew him, who joined us. I thank you for hearing just my own account, my own reflection, which again, is not adequate, certainly not comprehensive, but hopefully hearing just a few stories about the legacy of my Rebbe Rav Tenler is something that can inspire us that we could follow in his ways of righteousness as well. Uh, so I want to just, it's, it's almost eight o'clock. I want to um, stop my speech over here and I'll stay on for a few minutes. I mean, I guess you could call this Q and A, so to speak. Um, I mean, I, again, I don't claim to be an expert on Rev Tendler, but in case anyone had any questions um, on anything that was mentioned, I just want to give you that chance first to speak up uh, if you have any questions or any thoughts. Uh, Toby. I, I'm fascinated about his his views on women learning Gemara when so few in that world approve of it even today. Um, what was Reb Moshe Feinstein's stance on that? It's a, it's a, it's a great question because like we said, Rav Tendler felt very much bound by Rav Moshe. Um, it seemed, you know, I actually, I pressed this. I asked Rav Tendler this one time and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't get a straight answer from him on this, but essentially what he said was if Rav Moshe understood more about how, like what Gemara learning looked like for women um, and why it's being done, the way I'm promoting it, he would approve of something like that. Uh, you know, if he got to see his great granddaughters learning Gemara, he would be very proud of them. And uh, because Rav Moshe, he, he, what he was opposing, and we'll do this as a shir, I, I was going to do this for Simcha's Torah about women dancing with the Torah as a case study in, in, in Judaism and how it deals with things like feminism. Rav Moshe was very anti-feminism. I mean, he was just anti-feminism. He was anti any ideology that sought to impose itself on the Torah. I mean, I'm sure he would say the same thing if like Christian, if a Republican Christians wanted to impose their views on the Torah, he would say the same thing. But um, the whole point of Rev Tendler was that it's not coming from a place of a, a social movement. We're not trying to, what do they call it? Um, not trying to uh, break the patriarchy, smash the patriarchy, whatever they say. But we really just want to come closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And, you know, and I, this is what I believe also. If we really believe, and I believe is that learning a Rav Chaim, you know, learning a Rav Chanan is really like the highest kiyam of Talmud Torah. Um, why wouldn't we want everyone to be able to appreciate the true depth that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has given us? So that's, um, that's, that's something. Um, I'm just going to take a look at the, uh, oh, okay, it was a direct message. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Alana. Does, any, does anyone, anyone else have any, um, any thoughts or questions that I could, I'm happy to speak more in the future if there's nothing right now. I, it's not like a shear where, you know, you usually have like questions and you want to like, you know, slug up someone, but was there anything else anyone wanted to, wanted to inquire about? Again, I, I want to thank everyone for their time. Thank you so much for coming to this session where I shared my reflections. Again, thank you so much to uh, the members of our shul, particularly uh, thank you to our president, Toby Schaefer, for being with us. And uh, also to those who came outside as well, Rabbi Siani, and I see Rabbi Dr. Uh, Abraham Unger, who was a Scott residence at our show in the past, um, is with us as well. Thank you all for joining. And uh, may we come together for happy occasions together in the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.